Former special counsel Bob Mueller will testify publicly before Congress next week. Today, Attorney General Bill Barr reemerged to undercut that looming hearing. I don't know if I'll be watching in real time, but I'm sure what he says will get to me somehow. I said all along that uh, I, had, I would not object to Bob going up to testify, but after I said that, uh, he indicated he was not interested in testifying. So I was disappointed to see him subpoenaed because I don't think that serves any pur purpose dragging uh, Bob Mueller up if he, in fact, is going to stick to the report. Uh, it seems to me the only uh, reason for doing that is to create some kind of public spectacle. And if, if Bob uh, decides that he doesn't want to be subject to that, then the Department of Justice would certainly back him. That is what shade looks like between a supervisor and his old employee. But that's the bar side. The more important piece is what we can learn from Mueller next week. Mr. President, on behalf of every one of the employees you see here before you and around the world, it is my privilege to welcome you to the FBI. We are not above using this occasion for recruiting purposes. But you are a wee bit past our age limit. <laughs> However, it is not too early for Sasha and Malia <laughs> to start thinking about joining the FBI. And so we would like to send you home with two official bureau teddy bears for them, as well as T-shirts. Teddy bears in the air. That was FBI Director Bob Mueller a decade ago, of course, speaking there with the first family and Barack Obama, welcoming the new president on what was his first official visit to the FBI and handing those two teddy bears over as gifts for the president's daughters. Now, that's about as warm and unscripted as Mueller ever gets in public, smiling, leaning into ceremonial event, honoring a president and the bureau. But you won't find much footage of Mueller ever showing more personality than that two teddy bear day. You can scour the archives. We did. That's about as far as it goes. The rest of the time, most of the time, Bob Mueller is more tight-lipped and taciturn. Next week, he testifies before Congress about his probe, an event that is literally the most anticipated hearing of the Trump era. Only Mueller knows what he intends to say. But right now, we have a special report for you on Mueller under oath with some clues on his approach and some reporting on how Bob Mueller testifies at hearings, because despite his secretive reputation, Mueller's long career means he's testified many times. In fact, you see right here some of them. We scoured decades of his hearings, over 60 appearances before Congress from his service at the FBI and DOJ, and we studied how he deals with assertive questioning, how he avoids certain things within his obligations, and how he lives up to a longstanding rep as the ultimate rule follower. Now, we found many similar responses from Mueller, going back to his first FBI director confirmation hearing. This was 2001, and he sparred with a U.S. senator about a controversial memo that was related to a previous investigation. The short answer, uh, Senator, is, is yes. And I think uh, no, it would I depend th on the I circumstance. Think, I think you I'm not certain what I would do in that circumstance, but I cannot tell you today that I absolutely would. Are you now saying, Mr. Mueller, uh, that you would, in fact, have turned over this memo of December 9th, 1996, on your own to the Senate Oversight Committee? I can't say with definitiveness now, at this time, I would. I cannot put myself, without all the facts, back into the position of the decision maker. If this committee, if those two men, the chairman and the ranking member, can't have access to this memorandum, I don't think Senate Oversight is worth a tinker's damn. I, I am making a distinction, Senator, if I might, and I'm saying in the case where there's been a request for this memorandum, I would expect that the request of the committee to get this memorandum would be accommodated. Well, Mr. That's Mueller, it. that doesn't uh, answer the question at all. That doesn't answer the question at all, which may have been Mueller's goal. Observe the rules, tell the truth, but just don't answer certain questions. He hasn't changed, not even his outfits, the dark jacket, the white shirt, the red checkered tie. And that brings me to a classic Bob Mueller riddle to keep in mind for next week. What's the difference between Bob Mueller and a bottle of wine? 
Line changes. Mueller doesn't. We check these tapes, and here's how he swats away hypotheticals and questions every time he doesn't want to answer. I hesitate to speculate because I have just a, a piece of the puzzle also. I would have to check to make absolutely certain. In every investigation, uh, there, uh, and particularly a fast-moving investigation, there are steps that are taken that may or may not work out. And it's very difficult to, to, to generalize uh, uh, or to, to reach some sort of understanding or make progress uh, with that uh, generalization. Those all sound like basically true statements, but they stop short of what the congressional questioners wanted to know. The point here isn't that Mueller's past hearing suggests he's trying to only be evasive or protect anyone, but rather that even when he's sitting on blockbuster evidence or dramatic stories, which you're about to see, his style is almost always just the facts. And that brings me, as I mentioned, to a key part of this report tonight on Mueller under oath. A huge legal scandal where you actually can get an apples to apples comparison of how Bob Mueller testifies about it compared to a peer. Consider a secret scandal that rocked the Bush administration and at one point boiled down to what Mueller and one other official knew about pressure that was applied, potentially illicitly, to the attorney general while he was lying in his hospital bed and how these two officials, who, spoiler, have both served as FBI directors, how they ultimately addressed this scandal when later questioned by Congress under oath. So this is like perfect Mullerology. It all started out with a scene that could have been out of born identity. Sounding like a movie plot, it happened three years ago in this Washington, D.C. hospital. Lying in bed there, the Attorney General, John Ashcroft. They wanted him to approve an extension of the secret NSA warrantless eavesdropping program over strong Justice Department objections, even though Ashcroft was seriously ill. Even though this all happened a few years ago, the details revealed just today could spell new trouble for the current Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez. The scandal was Gonzalez trying to strong arm the attorney general to approve a program that Comey and Mueller thought might be illegal. When the story finally came out, James Comey gave a dramatic rendering of it to a rapt congressional hearing. I raced to the hospital room, uh, entered, and uh, Mrs. Ashcroft was standing by the hospital bed. Uh, Mr. Ashcroft was lying down in the bed. The room was darkened. Director Mueller instructed the FBI agents present not to allow me to be removed from the room under any circumstances. And I went back in the room. Attorney General Ashcroft then stunned me. Stunned me. Comey goes beyond what happened, the facts, the confrontation, adding his reaction. He was stunned by what happened next. And Comey wants his listeners to be stunned, too, because, well, we know this by now. He's a vivid storyteller. So at that hearing, Comey then recounts the attorney general's next move. He lifted his head off the pillow and in very strong terms expressed his view of the matter, rich in both substance and fact, which stunned me, drawn from the hour-long meeting we'd had a week earlier, and in very strong terms expressed himself, and then uh, laid his head back down on the pillow, uh, seemed spent and said to them, but that doesn't matter because I'm not the attorney general. The last line showed Ashcroft's commitment to the rules. The acting attorney general is in charge. That matters for who is going to approve that program or who appoints a special counsel. It matters a lot. Now, Comey's testimony was accurate and gripping. But if you had to rely on Mueller's testimony to learn about that same event, Mueller being the other official who knew what went down, you'd get a pretty different picture. Here was Mueller's testimony about that interaction in that hospital room. And this Q&A is like pulling teeth with Mueller intent on saying as little as possible. Were you surprised when you received the phone call from Mr. Comey indicating uh -huh. that there was going to be this visit to Mr. Ashcroft by Gonzalez and Cart? Uh, it was out of the ordinary. You're the FBI director. A senior official calls you and says, make sure that I'm not evicted from the room. And I'm sure that must have struck you as being an unusual request, didn't it? Yes. Did you take notes or memorialize your conversation with Mr. Comey at that point? I don't know. At that point, I did not. At no, some I point, did you memorialize your conversations regarding this visit with Mr. Comey? I may have. Yes. Do you still have those notes? Yes. And are they available to the committee if the committee were to ask for them? I would uh, have to get back to you on that. Tell me why you decided to make notes of your conversation with Mr. Ashcroft. It was out of the ordinary. What was out of the ordinary, Ms. Mueller? 
being asked to go uh, to the hospital and, it, and, uh, and uh, be present at that time. <laughs> this is incredible. I mean, let's have real talk. When a constitutional crisis goes down in a hospital room and people with guns have to protect the acting attorney general from the president's counsel, yeah, it's out of the ordinary. It's a pretty understated way to put it. And you can see this contrast in how Comey describes the fallout from that incident and these other officials who were basically prepping a Saturday night style massacre of sorts for Bush. I prepared a letter of resignation intending to resign uh, the next day, Friday, March the 12th. You believe that others were also prepared to resign, not just you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Do you th was one of those Director Mueller? I believe so. You'd have to ask him, but I, I believe so. Comey's touting his readiness to resign there. Bush ultimately changed the program under that kind of pressure. And Mueller found a way to avoid even confirming this directly. He quoted Comey and then waved off requests to interpret this episode. I don't dispute what Mr. Comey says. Okay. Uh, what, what do you make of that whole uh, episode? Um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, uh, Congressman, I don't think it appropriate to speculate. I can, I can answer questions as to what happened to the extent that uh, uh, I'm able to. Uh, but beyond that, I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Were, were you, uh, well, can you confirm that uh, you and some of your agents were prepared to resign because of uh, leading up to this controversy? Again, I'm uncomfortable getting into uh, conversations I had with individuals uh, because I do believe that uh, individuals uh, uh, are entitled to my unfettered uh, thoughts. Now then the tricky lawyering kicks in because a congressman presses Mueller on whether he did prepare to resign over this and Mueller evades it by emphasizing, well, Comey's testimony said you'd have to ask Mueller. Was he correct? Or, or better yet, just were you that person? Well, I was that person to whom he refers, yes. And were you considering resigning? Uh, you don't again, have to relate I, a conversation. This is just your own mind. Did you I, under, I understand. Um, I understand why I cannot say that I do not dispute what Mr. Comey says, because Mr. Comey says, ask Mr. Mueller. I will tell you that I don't believe that it's appropriate for me to get into conversations that I've had with principals on that issue. There was a central question. Mueller slices it into pieces, dances around it, and then says, hey, I'm not going to tell you. I don't think it's appropriate. And this is really important for next week and the criminal evidence against the president. Congress never got a fuller answer on that issue there. So you can contrast now these two top officials discussing the same incident as a preview for next week. I raced to the hospital room. Uh, Mr. Ashcroft was lying down in the bed. The room was darkened. It was out of the ordinary. I prepared a letter of resignation intending to resign. I don't believe that it's appropriate for me to get into conversations that I've had with principals on that issue. Mueller will have even more rationales next week for why some answers aren't appropriate. Grand jury law, DOJ rules, the credible consideration that people Mueller indicted are still awaiting trial from the Russians at large to Roger Stone. Those rationales are legit, but we also know Mueller errs on the side of less comment regardless. Past special counsels have spoken freely. Mueller's team never did. If you're the spokesman for the special counsel's office, your job is to never say anything. No comment from the special counsel's office. The special counsel's office basically never says anything ever about any story ever. The special counsel's office declined to comment. The spokesman for the special counsel's office is declining to comment. The special counsel's office declined to comment. The special counsel's office almost never makes public comments. That's just a choice. We know that because other prosecutors would speak out far more starkly. Here's a prosecutor who probed a Democratic White House and told America his own conclusions. The president repeatedly tried to thwart the legal process. The president chose deception. Here's a prosecutor who probed a Republican White House and told America his own conclusions. The Iran-Contra cover-up has continued for more than six years. A part of a disturbing pattern of deception and obstruction that permeated the highest levels of the Reagan and Bush administrations. It can be done. You can hit the president with a two by four after you investigate him if you want, rhetorically. But Bob Mueller doesn't do that. 
And that brings me to the other thing you need to know if you want to understand the predicate and the facts for next week's blockbuster hearing. I'm talking about beef. How do people who wield the greatest power to investigate, to detain, to execute, how do they act when they surrender those powers and they have disagreements, rivalries, beef with the new folks who come into office? Well, some use their position to blast their foes in a new administration. And with Trump shattering norms, we've seen some veterans of public service go after him as basically a liar who's, quote, worse than Watergate and even guilty of, quote, treasonous conduct. When I use the term, this is nothing short of treasonous, I equate it to the betrayal of one's nation, basically aiding and abetting, giving comfort to an enemy. Watergate pales, uh, really, uh, in my view, uh, as, as compared to what we're, uh, we're confronting now. Those were lies, plain and simple. I'm about to talk to him about allegations that he was involved with prostitutes in Moscow and that the Russians taped it. That's one way to do it. Our reporting, though, tonight is after reviewing Mueller's 60 different times he testified before Congress, that's not Mueller's way, which gives you two implications for the hearing next week. The first may really disappoint those who want some kind of barrage against Trump that goes beyond the evidence in the report. Mueller's testimony typically does not opine. It doesn't traffic in the rhetoric of lies or treason or unverified stories about Russian prostitutes. The second implication is Mueller's testimony is the antidote to today's televised, tweeted political fights. He's not just the anti-Trump in a way. Mueller is also the anti-Comey and the anti-Brennan. And really, while we're at it, the anti-media. Trump's a reality TV president. He's adept at that part. Mueller is a facts prosecutor. He's adept at that part. The Mueller report is about facts, what they found, what the evidence shows, what the provable facts are. That is why, remember, so many people have already been charged and convicted from the Mueller probe. It's why Donald Trump broke the record for most advisors convicted this early in his presidency. What you see on your screen, not a record most presidents want to win. A useful hearing here could focus on the facts in the Mueller report. Now be ready for critics who then say, well, this hearing is just another round of the same old thing. President Trump recently tried out a version of that talking point. It's old news. But the point next week will not be about the age of the evidence against Trump. It will be about the truth. Now, I don't know if Bob Mueller's ever listened to the rapper Lecrae, but he does have some bars that apply exactly. People say I talk about the same old thing. The reason why I sound the same is because the truth don't change. The truth is the Mueller report lists substantial evidence that the president obstructed justice several times in office. Next week, Americans will hear Bob Mueller present his findings under oath for the first time. The truth as his investigation determined it. People can assess what those findings mean. Should Congress do anything about them? Should they impact whether this president is reelected? Those are open questions that, according to our research, Bob Mueller will not answer. It'll be just the facts. The rest is up to everyone else. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.